You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 40 of a Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I am your host, Carlton Gover, and I am joined by my co-hosts, Connor Johnnan and David Ian Howe. In this episode, we are interviewing Dr. Maddie McAllister. You might know her from her Instagram as Shipwreck Mermaid. Dr. McAllister is the Senior Curator for Maritime Archaeology at the Museum of Tropical Queensland and James Cook University. She is also an underwater archaeologist. None of us have any experience in underwater archaeology unless you consider Connor's career. And we are super excited to chat with her tonight. Dr. McAllister, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing this evening for us? But I guess good morning to you. Yes, good morning. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm doing very, very well. Well, good. Yeah, we're glad to have you. I'm finally glad we got you on here. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I feel like I have been watching from afar, but I'm interested to see what you guys reckon of the underwater sphere of what we do. That was well said. My (laughs) first question is, how does it feel to be in tomorrow? (laughs) Strange. How does it feel to be in the past? (laughs) Terrible. Welcome to American archaeology. (laughs) We live here. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, I guess archaeology is about the past. So, I mean, that's kind of cool, but you guys have koalas. So, I mean, that's (laughs) infinitely better. Yeah, it's a hundred points straight away, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Though I've like there's like an internet meme about them being just like terrible creatures. Like I don't I don't know if that's like a recent thing I've seen, but they still seem cute to me, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I won't burst your bubble. They're cute. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's kinda yeah. that's kinda where I'm at with it. <laughs> so do you wanna just kinda like explain to the audience like what what it is you do? Because like we obviously we know you're an Instagrammer, Instagram person, Instagram blog. I don't know what we are, but <laughs> your job and like what exactly it is you do. Yes. Okay. So straight off for people, what I do is shipwrecks. Essentially I research, study, excavate and manage shipwreck sites around Australia. Uh, At the moment I am based in Queensland. So I work on the Great Barrier Reef and manage a collection here. We call ourselves here maritime archaeologists in Australia. Okay. So that means like you do underwater archaeology, correct? Yes. Yes. There's probably a bit of discussion around terminology for that. Underwater archaeology, in my mind and many people's minds, means exactly that. What you study is underwater all the time. Maritime archaeology is slightly different. It means that we can go I guess, out of the water to our coasts and harbours and look at landscapes included in that as well. So I like to call myself an underwater archaeologist because I'd prefer to be underwater than walking around on the land. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, nice. Uh, So it seems like that's uh, uh, Australia might be a a good place for this underwater maritime archaeology. How did you actually make it through childhood in Australia? Because I, I've heard that everything in there actually tries to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys have bears, so I do always come back to that. You guys have bears, <laughs> you don't have that scary land thing. Um, look, I grew up in the Northern Territory, so right in the heart of I guess, like crocodile Dundee territory. So I grew up with saltwater crocodiles and snakes and numerous bugs and things like that. You learn from a very early age a healthy appreciation of the environment and respect for animals. At the moment where I am, I guess I'm faced with saltwater crocs again and Irukandji jellyfish, which uh, we don't swim in the coast for six months of the year because of them. And then you add sharks into the mix. So... It's a choice, I would say. You've got to be um, cautious, but it's a choice. I think that probably outweighs bears by a fair bit by now. I mean, extant ice age carnivores that exist in the <laughs> landscape versus jellyfish you can't swim in the ocean for six months out of the year seems a little worse. But yeah, uh, I never thought about that though. Like we just straight up have like wolves and bears just roaming the streets in parts of our country. Yeah, that is that is dangerous. Like, the moose are the worst part. They're actually really dangerous, but Really? Yeah, they can just like they can murder people if you like anger them. 
because they're just so oh. big. Yeah. Or, if, or if you get into a car accident and hit a moose, you you don't usually make it out. Yeah. Or bison. Bison hurt more people in this country than any other land mammal. Well, there you go. That's news to me. I, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Does that equal us out, though? I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. You got great whites yeah. <laughs> patrolling yeah. out there. You get you win. <laughs> it might have been a, a kookaburra. I don't know what it was, but it was some bird like chasing some kid on a scooter. Um, uh, magpies. It was a magpie. Yeah, okay. magpie season here when they're nesting. Um, yeah, it's pretty traumatic growing up as a kid having to walk past the nesting magpies. Oh. <laughs> they swoop you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing very well. Tourism Australia probably wouldn't hire me at this point, hey? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're doing it very well for America either <laughs> at this point. Uh, did you have any kind of early childhood experiences uh, with archaeology, anthropology? No, I would say I actually wanted firstly to be involved in the ocean. Apart from living in the territory, my family travelled a lot with mining here, um, most of my family's in the mining in some form. And I eventually spent a lot of my time in the southwest coast of Western Australia in a lovely little coastal town called Bustleton. That's where my grandparents were retired. And my granddad was a fisherman and loved to tell me tales of pirates and ships that went missing and ghost ships. So I balanced between wanting to be a marine biologist and then um, having these fantastic, I guess, nautical stories that were a big part of my childhood. So I didn't really come at it from an archaeology, anthropology sort of way. I certainly came at it more from an ocean and, and living on the ocean and being around the ocean and falling in love with that sort of legendary side of it, I guess. I guess this might be just a question for Australian history in general, but so we we all, most of us came here as like, I guess, immigrants, like back when it was like a British colony or whatever. And like, there's sailing stories and like, you know, like pirate stories, like back in the day, like the Caribbean and whatnot. But like in Australia, the whole continents, like obviously had to be sailed to. So like, do you guys grow up with like cool, like pirate and like sailing stories and stuff like that, I'd imagine, or like... I know there's like a lot of drinking songs about it. I've like heard from like movies and TV and stuff. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a lot of us are really recent families here. For example, my my mum was born in England, so I have half a family that's um, very English. Uh, the rest of my family is from Tasmania, from Hobart. I think that we have lovely stories more to do with the coast and animals and ocean, I think a lot of the time, a lot of what we talk about in terms of seafaring tales and, and getting to Australia maybe has to do more with World War II and and things like that. I think we certainly don't have tales of pirates here. We we live through that in the, the Caribbean and, and your area, I would say. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and also the Great Emu War, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god the great emu war I mean, it was real um, right like that was like one of the like the for like formative I, things in australia right i think for the audience uh look i maybe i'm gonna come across as a really bad australian here but i have no idea what the great emu war is are you talking oh about my, the war? oh my god get out of here <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I might be just taking burgles. <laughs> Isn't that when like there was like a bunch of miners, like English and like Chinese miners oh. that like like had a big skirmish with the British? Yeah, right? I think we call it the Boer War, like B O E R. Look, the East oh. Coast people are a different sort to the West Australians, so we probably call things very different what? things. Oh. <laughs> David, you it. are indeed talking about the Boer War. What Connor is <laughs> referring to is the Great Emu War, in which <laughs> that there was like a plight of emus of infecting. Uh, they're eating a lot of crops in, in Australian farmers. And oh. there was a federally funded campaign to get rid of emus, and they used the Australian Army, and it 
didn't work, and it's kind of like a joke of the great Emu War that the Australians right. lost against the Emus. Oh, that cool. sounds suspiciously like an East Australian thing to me. <laughs> we were <laughs> fighting rabbits on the other side of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to get a sidebar, but I guess what I, what I was going with with the the ship story stuff like that was like you. I guess you got interested in diving and, and going into these like shipwrecks as a kid from from something. So was it some like tale as a kid or some story as a kid or like you mentioned World War Two? Yeah. Like, would you want to elaborate on that? So, I guess probably one of the biggest cultural identities of Australians is that we are an island nation. So coast and ocean and being around the ocean is a big part of a lot of our lives. And I certainly had that. I'd say that my granddad was the equivalent of a farmer turned into an old salty sea dog. Uh, So he relished (laughs) telling me stories, many of which I now know aren't true. And I believed (laughs) very heavily when I was a kid. So I think it maybe comes from our English heritage on my side of the family, for sure. He told me tales of uh, like the Mari Celeste and ghost ships and things like that. So we certainly are in and around a lot of marine things and seafaring. And that would have been what drove me to really have a love and passion for it. I guess the older side of why I'm interested in shipwrecks does come from, as a a kid, I loved looking at ancient Egypt and things like that. And then I figured I could put the two together. So study old things, but also be in and around the ocean. And that came down to shipwrecks for me. That's very cool. Yeah. So when we initially get into archaeology and we're doing our school and everything like that we have to at least in america and in other countries we have to take a, a field school as part of that and this is just and it's kind of constitutes like your training of how you do archaeology do you guys have something like that for maritime archaeology Yes, it uh, it depends on which university you go to. So I did do my undergraduate degree and my master's at Flinders University in Adelaide and they are Australia's core university but also one of the leaders in the world in maritime archaeology. So they're renowned for having one to two field schools a year that are intensive. I guess it would be similar to what you're saying, two-week sort of going and doing a project and getting these practical hands-on skills that you don't get in the classroom. Very cool. Very cool. Where did you work on your field school? So I jumped into field school as soon as I got into uni. I think I was a first year student when I managed to get onto one of the field schools, which are typically reserved for third and final year students. And that was to a little coastal town in South Australia Uh, We were searching for a shipwreck um, on the coast there, but also just doing the basic skills, learning how to map underwater. I think it's very easy for people to forget that it can be hard enough to survey and record a site on land when you add the fact that you're under the water and you can't speak anymore to your partner or your buddy that's helping you record. Uh, It takes a lot of practice and learning to get that down pat. Excellent. And and a question that I have for you is, in, you know, in the United States, archaeology is a subdiscipline of anthropology. Is that the same in Australia or are you guys more like the European system where archaeology is a form of history? And uh, does maritime archaeology, where does that fit in that grander scheme? Uh, we are such black sheep, I think, in every um, group that you look at. In Australia, archaeology certainly sits within its own. It's in a social science uh, history look. Anthropology for us is quite a different field, really looking at cultural studies and and things like that. So archaeology definitely sits looking at the material things only. Then within maritime archaeology and the wider archaeology in Australia, it's a tricky one because we do you know, focus on history. We do a lot of science, as you guys know, I think what people would call classic science, a lot of samples and analyzing we do as well. So somehow we have to sort of sit across two or three disciplines, whether it's science and history and social science, it's sort of all mixed into one. That's super cool. I think we enjoy having folks um, from different countries and kind of asking these questions because it's 
it's interesting how folks kind of approach these things and we are, we are always learning something as, as part of this process. So that is super, super helpful that you explained that to us. <laughs> How do you map underwater? Because I, I I map, I do GIS, and I can't imagine Sky trying map. to get <laughs> this kind of I can't imagine trying to uh, yeah do the land techniques underwater. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a way. So I was taught in the very traditional way of uh, manual techniques. So. I guess the beauty of working on a shipwreck is the site sort of sits within itself. It's not really in relation to the landscape it's around. So mapping its exact location with everything else isn't such a huge priority. We're more interested in completely and detailed recording of the ship itself and how that has broken down and how it is what we see today. So a lot of the recording for maritime archaeology that I was taught is basic tape measures underwater and baseline offset trilateration from points there. And you can imagine that underwater, that takes a very long time um, (laughs) to plot together. Maybe not the most accurate, but certainly once you have had a lot of practice in that, it becomes just sort of a skill that you have and a way that you work underwater. Today, it's very different. And I would say the advances that underwater archaeology has made in terms of recording that go hand in hand with photogrammetry and advances in computer algorithms for 3D modeling has helped maritime archaeology probably more so than other disciplines purely because we now have a way to very quickly record these highly detailed sites you know, in a time limit that would once take us months and months and now we can do in a couple of dives. So I'm one of those fortunate people that had to learn the really hard way and we certainly (laughs) still do the hard way to just to double check, but I now know and appreciate the beauty of our modern technology. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a scientist, but I don't think GPS (laughs) waves go through water, but... That's that's just the guess on my part. And on that note, we are going to end this first segment. We are interviewing Dr. Maddie McAllister, and we will catch you in the second segment. Welcome back to episode 40 of A Life in Ruins podcast. We are currently interviewing Dr. Maddie McAllister, who lives in the future. And we wanted to, to focus this segment on kind of your drive to get into higher education and ultimately get a doctorate. So what was your kind of impetus to continue into more school, I guess? I'm going to be one of those terrible academics and say that a lot of the drive was the fact that I guess in our modern world, you have to have an extra level of education. It's it's no longer really good enough just to have an undergraduate for our field. So I don't know if that was similar for you guys, but certainly my master's getting that after my undergraduate degree, the drive was to be more employable at the same time. Yeah, that's normal for you guys too. Yeah. Like my parents were just like, you have to get a master's. So I was like, (laughs) all right, guess I'm getting a master's. (laughs) Anyway, continue. So. (laughs) <laughs> no, all good. The The other bit, I guess, is the fact that you get to keep doing research. So part of doing master's over here for me, it was 18 months for a course and a year of that was coursework and, you know, getting to live on uni and study from well-known maritime archaeologists, get to go on field schools and be involved in that side. And then at the end of it, choose a research topic and really invest my time into something that I really loved. So it's maybe a twofold answer to that one for, for my master's. That's for sure. Yeah. We're, we're definitely considered, um, once you get your master's here, you're considered a professional archeologist. So it definitely pays to, to get that extra degree. Um, it might not actually pay well, but cause that's archeology, <laughs> but that's, that's a whole yeah. other thing. <laughs> what, what was your topic that you ended up writing them um, while getting your master's? This is actually perfect. I worked on American whale ships. That was my interest. It's a little known part of Australian colonial history that some of the biggest visitors we had on the coastline, particularly in Western Australia, where I was, 
were American whalers and whale ships in the early 19th century. So we didn't know about it. There's a bit of taboo about whaling today. You know, you, you're taught very early on that whales are lovely creatures and not to hunt them. So this side of history was um, fascinating to me. So yeah, so good that I'm telling you guys about it. <laughs> You mean Americans are traveling the world at exuberant expense in the hunt for oil? Carter me <laughs> shocked. <laughs> yes, long history of that. Yeah, it actually, like, it's fascinating. There were tensions between the British colonial um, pioneers in Western Australia because they'd come over with very little, very little support from their home country, no infrastructure, no ability to really build really technical things. And then they see these massive, well-equipped American ships essentially plundering the coastline and doing a far better job than they were. So there's lots of really interesting sort of social history aspects there as well. But certainly Americans were one of the most educated about our coastline and really knew a lot about how to navigate Australian waters in the early 1800s. I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) I uh, I can't remember what book I read. I just I I'll have to look up the title, but I just read a a book on kind of the Nantucket Cape Cod whaling yeah. that happened in like the 19th century, and that's it's super interesting. And the whole process of how they hunt the whale, how they process the whale, which is, has to be like the worst job ever, like yeah. dead yeah. dead carcass, and then uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I so I guess I looked at it from I loved all of that side and and finding out that information, but I really wanted to know if if whale ships were a had a type and if you could identify a shipwreck by how heavily and strongly built like a big bathtub and determine that it was a whale ship. So they certainly sounded like very disgusting, smelly, cramped quarters to travel around the coast in but yeah yeah, fantastic like like you're saying with the Nantucket you know that aspect was as far as I know you know an entire American town would invest all of their money into one whale ship that would go away for up to five years and and you know and most of them wrecked somewhere else far away in the world and so we have a lot of them in the southwest of western Australia I worked on two or three American whale ships there that just never made it home. So the impact on that community in America must have been pretty impressive, pretty, pretty bad, but pretty big. Did you keep studying whale wrecks while getting your dissertation or did you kind of switch gears, do something different? Yeah, I guess that gave me a real passion, which I still have today for ship construction. One of my favorite things is learning how ships were built and put together and we can actually learn a lot about the ship itself from the really minute details of that. But I certainly switched gear for my PhD um, after completing a master's thesis. And part of that was the project that I was associated with. So I was invited as a PhD candidate for a big research project called Shipwrecks of the Roaring Forties. And that was a three to four year project here in Australia that essentially said, Uh, Australians in Western Australia were some of the biggest sort of researchers and excavators of shipwrecks in the 1970s and how can we find out new things and new information with our technology that could not be done 40 years ago. So I switched from American whale ships to a much more practical approach to how to record shipwrecks in Western Australia. We certainly don't have often the nice calm, beautiful waters, typical of famous shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. We live on a very harsh coastline with dynamic limestone reefs and swell. And there's a reason a lot of these ships ended up where they were. So I wanted to see if uh, photogrammetry and 3D modeling could record our sites better than we had in the past and perhaps give us more insight than we could. And that was the basis of my PhD, essentially. That's really cool. (laughs) So you're a curator as well? Yes, I am now a curator. That is my job title here at the Museum of Tropical Queensland in Townsville. So that means that while I get to still be a maritime archaeologist and do my research and field work, I also have the joint role of communicating what we do and working in a collection here and working on exhibitions. So 
it certainly is a really good job. I love both sides of that. And it's an interesting mix. Yeah. I'd say you lucked out. That's like kind of the ideal job, I would say. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like always weird to say yourself. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you get to spend uh, your time inside when the Irukandji are about, and then when they're when they're gone, you need to go back into the water. That sounds like absolutely fascinating. Like one of my, we have a thing. We have a thing in the states called Shark Week on Discovery Channel where they just yes. do nothing but sharks. Yeah, yes. But I remember I one year they talked Week. exactly favorite <laughs> love August. They talked about Irukandji one episode, and I, I vividly remember that. I was like in third grade, and they're talking about this killer jellyfish that is translucent and is tiny, and it just, oh, yeah, no. Oof. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think no amount of morphine can stop the pain of Irukandji stings, from what I'm told. People have to be restrained because they would rather kill themselves than continue through the pain of being stung. So I certainly oh stay gosh. out of the water in those months. Yeah. <laughs> that is terrifying. Yeah. That yeah. people would rather kill themselves than yeah. deal with the ongoing pain from a jellyfish. Yeah. That is nightmare inducing. <laughs> you should let me sidebar because they did a, a river monsters on this and the way they get the anti-venom for that stuff oh, is no. they have, they have to like, this guy like hand picks up the jellyfish to tr- like trim the the like nettles and like the the things and that's the way he yeah so jeremy wade like picks up one of these things and it's, no. it's brutal it's, it's it's scary speaking of scary when you're out in in the water like as, as you mentioned before here in america we we, we you know we meet connor david working in wyoming very terrestrial high desert, not much water around and definitely not enough to like, you know, suffocate us unless we were really feeling like it that day. There's moose. There's moose. Got a lot of moose moose. running around. (laughs) Uh, Moose and bison. But um, when you are doing conducting underwater or maritime archaeology, are there fears that you especially feel when you go into that environment, right? Yes. Thank you for phrasing it that way because the biggest question I get is, but what about sharks? Um, Particularly in Australia at the moment, sharks seem to be prolific in the media as infesting waters and, and being this thing we have to get rid of. And I'm very passionate about the fact that I've made a choice to work in the ocean and that's not my home, that's their home. And that's a clear message that I have. So there's always a risk of some way of animals like that in the ocean Underwater archaeologists are particularly, I like to think we're better off because a lot of the work we do is on the ground. We essentially get into the water, descend to the bottom and spend our time with our faces buried in a shipwreck on the ground. And from studies, as far as I can understand, they perceive that a lot of shark attacks happen in that water column. And that's why surfers particularly are prey to shark attacks like that. So the other side about that I often don't get to talk and you, you preface that really well is, is the environment. And I have seen some incredible ocean storms. I have seen swells and waves. I work on once incredibly strong, structurally sound man-made vessels that somehow ended up on the bottom of the ocean with often quite a lot of people never making it back to land. So my I guess one of the biggest risks is actually working in the water and understanding that you're in an environment that can change drastically. You're in an environment that humans were not really made to dwell in and live in. So there's a huge amount of physiological aspects of working on underwater shipwrecks that you have to take into account. So that was a very long answer to your question, but I see the animals that I work around as it's their home and I accept that I'm there. I am more concerned and I spend a lot more of my time assessing the risk of the water that I'm in and the environment on that day and what will happen pretty much. And you had said earlier you wanted to be, you might have wanted to have been like a marine biologist too. So that's kind of <laughs> cool. Like you get to like appreciate the the environment you're in in that, that sense, which is... yeah. Isn't yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And I, I'd imagine when you are looking at shipwrecks down there, like you can see all those like really neat ecosystems that grow on the ships, right? Like I, I only see them in documentaries. I don't know if that's like on every shipwreck or not, but. 
Yeah, actually, there is a very famous shipwreck off our coastline here that I'm working on at the moment with some other maritime archaeologists and some coral scientists. So it's called SS Yongala or the Yongala. It's tragically known as Australia's Titanic and it was one of our luxury steamships operating up and down the coastline. It went missing in a cyclone in 1911 with every single person on board. They found a few washed up broken boxes and bizarrely a racehorse that was traveling on the ship, but never any bodies or any lifeboats or anything like that. Uh, It was found in the 1950s. It sits about 40 minutes off the coastline here and it's a 100 metre long steamship in 30 metres of water and it has essentially created a incredible, wonderful oasis for underwater marine life. So that is coral, that's fish. It is apparently one of the top 10 dive sites in Australia and people come from all over the world to see it. So my research in that is actually working with coral scientists to understand what the impact of this wreck is in that marine ecosystem and the impacts of tourism, but also the way we have changed this shipwreck site to be something very hauntingly beautiful and respectful to to the people that lost their lives on it. So it's very incredible. If, if you guys ever come over here and want to dabble your toes in the water, <laughs> I suggest going on to Yongala. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Maybe. That, doesn't, that doesn't sound like a no. Like, I'm down. <laughs> Excellent. Do I need to know how to swim? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say that when I took my first scuba class, there was, there was an individual that got up and was like, well, you guys teach me how to swim in this course. And then our scuba instructor was like, no, that's kind of a pre <laughs> prerequisite for like learning how to scuba dive. And she just like walked out. Uh, yep. <laughs> Does your department at the, Museum of Tropical Queensland have kind of a a legacy, something they study specifically? Yes. So one of Australia's most famous shipwrecks is HMS Pandora. And I'm not sure if you guys will know, it's a very English side of seafaring history, but in the late 1700s, there was a mutiny on a British naval ship in the Coral Sea here called the Bounty. So it's mutiny on the Bounty, I think. Pretty sure they made a terribly, terribly wonderful movie starring Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins in like the 80s about it. Essentially, it's everything you love about a a seafaring tale. It's mutiny and a captain being kicked off a ship and the mutineers living on Pacific Islands in this tropical wonderland. And then the British put their foot down and said, how dare anyone mutiny on one of our ships? We're going to send... Pandora to chase you down across the Pacific and bring you back and bring back the bounty. Little did they know that the bounty had been burnt by the mutineers on um, an island called Pitcairn Island here. And unfortunately, the crew and captain of Pandora learnt the hard way that navigating the Great Barrier Reef and the Torres Strait through Australia is a terribly difficult, dangerous thing to do. And so HMS Pandora sunk in 1791 right up the coast here. It was found in the late 1970s by some well-known divers up here and subsequently excavated over nine seasons between the 1980s and 1990s by the Queensland Museum. So my job here now, I'm the only maritime archaeologist left in the museum here and I look after the incredible collection excavated from HMS Pandora, which was so well-preserved we have um, things like coils of rope still in their bundles, ivory, the surgeon's pocket watch, um, incredible wow. things. Yeah, they tell us incredible stories about life on board, particularly a well-known well-known ship sent to do a very important thing. So there's so much research to do still uh, on this collection and that's part of the legacy that I have here. That is I, awesome. Yeah, that is super <laughs> cool. And on that note, I think you just opened Pandora's box. And, uh, <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to end this segment and we'll catch you in the third. Welcome back to episode 40 of a Life in Ruins podcast. We're talking with Dr. Maddie McAllister of uh, the Univer- Museum of Tropical Queensland, University of Tropical Museum. 
There we go. I never do this right. Every time I mess up, it's just a thing I do. So <laughs> Museum of Tropical Queensland, we currently live in the, uh, the not roaring twenties. Uh, it was supposed to be roaring twenties, but they're, it's the opposite of that. We were going to talk today about the, the roaring forties and the shipwrecks of those in Australia. Do you want to, do you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. So I did hint to in one of the um, previous segments, the fact that I did my PhD in association with the shipwrecks of the Roaring Forties ARC linkage project. So a big research project here in Australia. And it was investigating the last sort of 40 to 50 years of maritime archaeology and how we could apply new technologies and tools to these shipwrecks and learn more or ask new questions that they couldn't in the 1970s. And the title from that, so the Roaring Forties is this incredible phenomena that occurs between the 40th and 50th latitudes when ships, particularly in this case, Dutch East India Company ships were traveling around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa and they were trying desperately to get up to Indonesia and they would hit this band in the roaring 40s, which was just very strong winds that pushed them very quickly across the Indian Ocean and often too quickly and they hit the West Australian coast before being able to turn and head north. So Western Australia has a handful of Dutch East India Company ships, uh, very early ones there. And I was involved extensively in looking at Batavia, which is another, I seem to find myself always with the mutiny stories. It's another mutiny story (laughs) from history, Uh, quite a fantastical one. I guess I should premise that with, have you guys heard of Batavia before? It's probably a good idea. Batavia? Batavia? Batavia, Batavia. It's a Uh, ship, the ship. I have not. I have not either. It does not surprise me. That's totally fine. I was just checking. It is this incredible story. Uh, So in 1629, it was heading around the Cape of Good Hope with two other ships in, I guess, convoy with it. And it was a flagship for the VOC. It was carrying chests of silver and Dutch immigrants to Indonesia to start a new life there. And they hit the Abrolhos Islands off the Midwest of Western Australia in the middle of the night in winter and wrecked there, which is a very, very long way away from Indonesia. And essentially the captain set off in some longboats to get help from Indonesia, leaving all of the passengers and some of the naval officers on the islands and unfortunately left in charge of a very, very crazy Um, man who was planning a mutiny to steal all the silver in the first place. And what proceeds after that is terrible tales of murder and massacres on these desert islands in the middle of nowhere, all over silver um, becoming rich. So it was apparently a very famous Dutch story. Um, After this, the, the story was sold back in the Netherlands, but it is quite an eerie place to visit because of the ship and the shipwreck. But then also um, these islands today are very barren looking desert islands that sit on wonderful coral reefs. So part of my work with that was assisting in research into excavating some of the burials from these massacres and um, trying to find out who these people were that were buried there. I think it's roughly about 200 people were murdered over a couple of weeks or months after the Batavia shipwreck. So um, it's a morbidly fascinating tale that plays a very large role in Western Australian heritage now. As David and Connor can attest to and absolutely hate about me, like I'm a really large history buff, especially when it comes to World War II aircraft and just general World War knowledge. Here we go. Awesome. Uh, Here stop we go. it, David. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Australia was under threat of invasion for the Japanese like 1942, 1943. And what is, yes. in terms of like maritime archaeology and, and contributions to recovering of war dead in the Pacific, because mm. here in the United States, we have a couple programs where they send archaeologists out to like, I think it's Guam, not Guam. Yeah, Guam, like uh, major islands where there's conflicts to recover war dead, but especially just north of Australia, you have some pretty pivotal battles in, you know, world history. Yes. And so like, how does that play into, you know, Australian research when it comes to maritime archaeology? 
Yes. Good question. So twofold, I would say that I know of, there was lots of research over the past 20 years in locating one of our famous shipwrecks, HMAS Sydney, that disappeared without a trace in 1943, I believe. So that uh, has now been found and it sits at an incredible depth, something like two kilometres off the northwest coast of Western Australia. Um, certainly is a war grave. Our approach is not to disturb that war grave, to, to leave them at peace. The second side of that is that I don't think we actively go out to recover human remains. I think at the moment, um, most maritime archaeologists I know and, and heritage practitioners have been more surprised at the fact that our shipwrecks may not actually be safe where they are in the water. And there's been a very recent trend of entire shipwrecks being completely salvaged off the seafloor in a matter of months for scrap metal that were um, I think the particular ones I'm thinking of were Dutch Dutch World War II vessels, but they um, are incredibly close to Australia and we have Australian vessels out there as well that may face the same fate, which is gobsmacking for one, but also you almost don't believe that it's possible to lift these entire shipwrecks off the floor. Yeah, I was I was going to ask, like, how how do you decide what ships that you want to remove from the the seafloor and what what ones stay because obviously there is some sort of ecosystems that develop around there so how do you make that kind of decision yeah so those ones i'm talking about were illegally salvaged by other countries for us for excavating now i i don't think we have completely excavated a shipwreck since the batavia shipwreck was excavated in the 1970s the one reason for that, like you're saying, is the fact that you disturb an ecosystem that is growing there happily and quite well often on a shipwreck, it's created its own little reef or it's become a part of a reef. The second aspect is that everything that we pull out of the ocean takes a very, very long time to conserve to a level where it can be dry again. So Wood, for example, if you pull wood from a shipwreck that's been underwater for 200 years and just leave it out to dry, it shrivels and cracks and distorts because the cells, the wood cells have broken down. So there's an extensive process of replacing that with a substance, which is kind of like wax. So there's a huge conservation cost to excavating shipwrecks. And even once that's done after about 20 or 30 years and everything's ready to be um, on display or stored in a dry state, they forever have to be in an air conditioned climate controlled space for eternity. So not that I like to think that cost has anything to do with how we do research in our history and heritage, but we certainly find that maritime sites have a bigger toll on research in terms of boat time and capabilities and then conservation than a lot of other archaeology at the moment. I don't know if that answers your question though. No, that's a, that's 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 great because we we have this thing known as like the curation crisis here in America where we don't have enough storage space for all the stuff that we end up pulling from excavations and and whatnot and and don't actually conserve things correctly because we just don't have the funds like you were mentioning or the the time or anything like that. So I was just mm-hmm. picturing like how I mean a whole ship. And like, <laughs> I don't know how you would do something like that. It just, it hurts my brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, that, um, we use chainsaws, if that helps you. Underwater chainsaws. What? So often bits are, uh, we pull you them just apart. you chop it off with a chainsaw? <laughs> no, that doesn't um, help. That's terrifying. <laughs> Big, like some of these things. So that is, um, that example is from Batavia. Some of the timbers from that were from extinct Eastern European forests that didn't exist even when Batavia was built in the early 1600s. So they were reused giant pieces. And I mean giant, like the size of a, I don't know, a ute or a truck, as you guys would call it. And you just, you physically cannot lift it onto a boat that's only twice the size of that. So in some cases, we um, they had to chop them into smaller pieces to, to lift them up um, and get them on board. But mapped out like a puzzle. It all went back together like an Ikea 
<laughs> boat at the end of it if that <laughs> calms you down a bit. <laughs> this might be my inner anthropologist talking. What did what did you refer to as a truck before calling it a truck? Oh, a, a ute? A ute. We call them utes in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, like a utility vehicle. A ute. Yeah. Oh, yeah, ute. I've, my brain went immediately to like the ute nation here in like Utah. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh. what? <laughs> utes? Like, where is this coming from? No, but... uh. Uh, I'm looking up this Batavia thing here on Google. Yeah, like, cool. This is blowing my mind. This is crazy. It's, it's a great, like it is a fascinating tale. And when you go there, I, there's something to be said for reading history and then going and, and seeing the exact place where you've read about these accounts from people. And it is a terrifically haunting and moving set of very small islands essentially in the middle of nowhere. So I recommend reading one of the um, books, Mike Dash's, I think it's Batavia's Graveyard by Mike Dash is a brilliant and easy read too about that story. Okay. Excellent. Well, <laughs> riding this wave into the next question. <laughs> um, <laughs> shut up. Uh, you have a very popular Instagram call, account called um, The Shipwrecked Mermaid, which is how we yes. found you. Um, what was the impetus for you, like, especially in archaeology here in the United States, public outreach, not so hot, doing SCICOM, not so hot in terms from the academy. But what was your impetus for creating this Instagram and how have people responded to it? I wanted to show the science behind what we do. So I, I was sick of telling people, you know, you get introduced to someone and, and you tell them, that, oh, I'm an underwater archaeologist and they ask you how much treasure you've found or have you found Atlantis or they recount some documentary that was made about treasure hunters and illegal salvages that seems to convey all of the excitement and the love of shipwrecks in the ocean and none of the ethics. So I really wanted to create an account that showed the daily life of underwater archaeologists. So the exciting side, which I tend to talk about the most, which is the shipwrecks and these tales and diving and working on field work. But I also wanted to show that, hey, we actually, we're accountable and we do all this research. And part of why we do this is to tell you, the public, the stories that you might not know otherwise. And that's, it's not in chase of treasure, I guess, is the short answer of that. I wanted to, like you guys are saying, I wanted to inspire new generations of people to not just pick a job that was easy and and not to be scared of following a passion that you have from a young age just because people tell you there's no money in archaeology or you won't get paid for it doesn't actually mean that's true. So I, it's twofold. I just wanted to share the work we do and, and I love meeting you guys who are other archaeologists and have the same sort of message like we do wonderful things yes there's hard work and lots of sitting in labs and writing reports and publications and the boring side but we do the exciting stuff too and no we're not treasure hunters essentially right man (laughs) i'd seen your account for a while and then like all of a sudden you were like doing question and answer stuff in your stories one day. And then you started posting like really like long form posts of like, like one about the Kraken and then like another yes. like long thing about shipwrecks. And I was like, Maddie in the game. Oh, sorry. Just <laughs> busted my mic everywhere. But yeah, I was stoked. Cause like, I don't know anything about underwater archeology span or maritime archeology. span So it was like super cool to see that. And then I saw you got tons of engagement obviously, because you were like, people were asking you questions that you were answering and I didn't know the yeah. answers to those either. So yeah, congrats. Yeah. Cause it's like, that's how it, like, it should be working, you know, and that's good. Yeah. Thank you. And I guess what I learned from that is that it's so much hard work. And when you add, um, like I couldn't imagine studying at the same time as, as doing anything like that, but working a full-time job and then pulling together content and questions and actually answering things does take a lot of your time. So it is wonderful to have responses from people and like an honest questions. I, I love the fact that a lot of people that, you know, it might be a slow growing account, but it's because people are genuinely interested in, in what I'm saying and are curious. The curiosity is fantastic. So I haven't forgotten that. And I know I've forgotten Shipwreck Tuesdays for quite a few weeks, but they are coming back. <laughs> I just stopped doing like days because I'm like, I never can stick to it. <laughs> yeah. Hard, we used to do- yeah. 
We used to have this thing called Feature Friday, but it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. We feel All you. of a sudden it's Wednesday <laughs> and I was like, oh, I missed another one. <laughs> I learned real quick. I had my, I have a small audience. It's mostly thanks to David. Um, asked me to post regularly. And I, I told him, I was like, yeah, I'll post more about Plains Indian archaeology daily at the beginning of November and did one post and haven't sent it. So it's been like a month and a half. Um, but yeah. Dr. McCosker, for those of our listeners that are interested in maritime archaeology or even, you know, Australian maritime archaeology, is there like a book that you could recommend that people could refer to to kind of maybe spark their passion? Oh my gosh. This is for you, Caleb Welch. <laughs> a single book. I'm just trying to think of the books that really inspired me to get into some of this. Look, I actually found that Australian maritime archaeology features pretty heavily in some of the global books. So there's some brilliant books. There's one by George Bass, which is quite an old book now, but it's all about the fantastic shipwreck sites around the world and what they've told us. And there's some Australian ones in that. The other ones that I read are terribly academic and I don't think they would interest a lot of people. But You'd I'm be surprised. Really- <laughs> we have a decent amount of like archaeology students on there. So if there, even there's an academic book, just go ahead and drop it. Oh, okay. Well, there is, um, there is um, maritime archaeology in Australia, I believe. I'm busily trying to search my desk for um, the book so that I can say it. Look, I cannot tell you off the top of my head. A lot of what I read were, were publications and articles, if, if that makes a difference for academic stuff. I'm going to have to do a little bit of search and maybe send you guys a few photos of them, I reckon. We, yeah, we can put it yeah. in like the episode. Yeah, we can put it in. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, we don't want to. That's why I didn't mean to like blast you on the spot there. I deeply apologize. Because as um, through the course of this, I've become interested. I'm like, I want to know more. But yeah, David, go ahead. I guess to, a, a better question then would be to end this. If you could tell the audience like one thing that you're passionate about or like one thing you would like to stress about your career and like your job or about like Australian archaeology in general, like what would you like to say? I guess I would like to say that even though we have stopped actively excavating and working on shipwrecks in the last 20 years for a variety of reasons, it's not as prolific as it was in the 80s and 90s. We are still out here actively working and we're still doing excavations and we're still learning new things and exciting things. So I'd probably say just stay tuned and wait to see what the next shipwreck discoveries are from Australia. Awesome. And, awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on today and, and joining us and chatting with about this stuff. It's been a lot of fun. This is one of the things that I get really excited about is kind of maritime history. So I was glad to have you on and, and chat. Thank you very much. I could have kept going for another hour quite easily. I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface. So um, uh, we can it's definitely great. have you back on soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great um, to talk to other archaeologists too. So thank you brings a different yeah. light which is awesome yeah absolutely and because this this podcast is called a life in ruins uh, we like to ask our guests <laughs> if you were given the chance again would you still choose to live a life in maritime ruins <laughs> absolutely i would not have it any other way <laughs> well i probably <laughs> maybe not in a shipwreck though i'd like to not bring <laughs> a shipwreck that is fine thing I'll happily study them. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, thanks again. (laughs) Thank you. And uh, Shipwreck Mermaid is her Instagram if you guys want to check it out. Yep. Well, everyone, we just interviewed Dr. Maddie McAllister. You can find her on Instagram at Shipwreck Mermaid and on Facebook by the same name. So thank you, Dr. McAllister. And with that, we are out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So this is the continuing series of dad jokes sent to me from my father. So this is dad jokes from my dad. Love you, Dean. Uh, so, so what happens when frogs park illegally? Oh my god! What happens? <laughs> um, they get towed. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, God. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Connor. With that, we are out. <laughs> This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.